Hello everybody. Welcome back to the Neuralizer channel. This is part two of our discussion video. I guess you could call it a series. Um, that sounds probably a little bit too formal for what it really is, but uh, this is uh, the second video of our discussion topic um, from a few weeks ago that was how would you describe your religious upbringing? And I have Catherine and Everett here with me uh, on Zoom to continue that discussion. So the format for this recording is um, that we're going to, we didn't really talk, in the last discussion we spent most of the time talking about the uh, various factors that played into our uh, religious upbringing when we were little, um, and we didn't really talk about why we were talking about that last time. So this time we're going to go ahead and start with the why, and I'm going to let Everett uh, springboard off of this to kind of tell his story and why this is significant to him, and uh, just let him kind of freeform that part of it, and then we'll probably, after that, continue our discussion of the topic that we discussed a few weeks ago. So Everett, do you want to go ahead and start us off? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, so <clears throat> this is, so let me preface this by saying this is a story I have not told uh, to many people. And so I'm not sure how, um, uh, I, I'm not sure how emotion, I'm not sure what my emotions are going to be walking through, walking through this. So we'll, we'll see. Um, but, uh, so we were all, uh, born together in the same family. We were all biological siblings, uh, and, uh, I'm the oldest and and let me also say that there's a difference of opinion here. I, I think pretty much probably anything I'm about to say is there there's differences of opinion about it. and i i'm I'm aware of that, and I'm not, you know, I'm sorry, I think i'm I'm having a a hardware. There we go. I think I'm plugged in now. Yeah, that, that audio sounds a little bit different. So you, you changed something. Did you plug in your headset? I, I did. I, I, I didn't realize that the hardware wasn't uh, plugged in there. Okay. You, um, you, were cu you were coming through before that. It'll just sound a little bit different now. So don't, you don't have to worry about repeating yourself. Okay. Yeah, never. Just, you know, my, uh, my video will come back. For some reason, it's having problems. But I know it's not okay. fun talking to a blank screen. But Okay, yeah. no, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, so there, there's differences of opinion about pr probably everything I'm about to say. So, uh, I, and I think all of us, but focusing on me, I grew up, uh, a, a Protestant Christian, uh, and that is because, uh, my parents, Steve and Betsy DePanger, were active Protestants uh, and immersed us in Protestantism, as we discussed a little bit. Uh, or, uh, my perception is that that's what we discussed last week. And uh, that was a very important part of my life uh, for a number of years. And I became, uh, I, I over the course of high school, uh, particularly the final couple years of high school, I shifted into being an agnostic. And that was a, a very challenging experience for me, although that's, that's not the, the central issue of what we're here today to discuss. Uh, and so I went down uh, I went down that road. 
I grew up. And that was in, um, so that would have been in, 2002 is, is really where I, I became aware uh, that I was uh, a an agnostic, or at least, or, or, or uh, the word came to me somewhat later, but it was it was in tw in 2002 that I realized the the substance of it. Uh, so, I grew up, moved on with my life. That was all in California. I moved to Arkansas in 2011. Uh, went to law school. And then at the uh, end of law school, on and, and specifically on uh, July 29th, 2014, uh, I got a call from my father who said that he was becoming a Roman Catholic, which is something that w was not entirely surprising because he had had some uh, there, he had expressed some contemplation of of that general type of thing over the previous years uh, but he nonetheless told me on that day he was becoming a roman catholic um and I, that was that was a challenge for me uh, because i was i had been a protestant and had been so extensively formed in my youth from him being a Protestant. But in and of itself, he, he had made that change, and I probably, you know, I, that would have just been something that would have happened in, in the course of life. But then, in the coming months, uh, in my perspective, uh, he he began denying that he had ever been a Protestant, and what came about, and I'm trying to use. You know, as as even language as I can, but it's it's difficult. Uh, what happened, in my view, was that a systematic effort arose to erase the family history of Protestantism, including my own, uh, and to create the impression that I had never been a Protestant. Uh, and I, all in the name of, I, I'm not even sure what, but it accompanied uh, his becoming a Roman Catholic. So this created uh, there, a tremendous amount of tumult. There were other issues going on within the family at the time as, as well, but there was a pretty intense period of family conflict um, that lasted for a bit over a year. And um, eventually, on October 5th, 2015, I left the family. And, um, excuse me, um, so I, I left the family, and so as, as a result of that, um, we are now, uh, no longer siblings in a, fa in a family sense of the word. We have maintained communication, uh, in varying levels over the years since um, but as of as of October fifteenth, twenty fifteen, uh, uh, I I'm no longer in the family, which is why I have been referring to uh, Stephen Betsy DePanger as as Stephen Betsy because I, in the years since I, I decided that was probably the best way to refer to them. 
Um, so that's nearly six years ago now. And I'm not going to go in here to the full effect of those events on me because I, I'm still in the process of, uh, of understanding them myself. Uh, and there's, there's a lot there, but after some discussion amongst the three of us, we decided that one positive step that we could take was to get together and just share about what our childhoods actually were. Um, because one thing I really appreciate about both of you is that both of you are willing to at least come out and, and say publicly that that you had a Protestant background and I had a Protestant background. And so to some extent, for me, this is a, it, 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 uh, the more I've been thinking about it, the more I've been realizing uh, now, and this is, you know, we're, we're recording this on June 19th, 2021. So when I say I'm still in the midst of a, a number of things, it's, you know, that's, that's the date uh, as of which I'm, still processing, but I, I'm viewing this as something of a coming out of the closet experience. Um, and it's not fully, it, it's, it's not fully a coming out of the closet experience because um, I, in my view, I was publicly a Protestant for a number of years. And there was a period of time when a lot, a lot of people around me would have known that. So I feel like I've been, there's been an effort to put me into a closet that I never wanted to be in. And now I'm coming, uh, coming back out of, of that closet, which is a, a very, it's, it's an, an ex, it's a very strange experience. It's a surreal experience. And, and I, like I said, I'm still processing all of what, what it, that is. But uh, for me, I think that these uh, these discussions are a step forward in that, and I uh, really appreciate both of you for, uh, for for participating in in that. And I think that's I think that's the that's my story. Thank you, Everett. <clears throat> Thank you for being willing to share that. Um, yeah, I agree. I think it takes a lot of bravery to um, say that with the level of transparency you just did. And I'm really sorry my video is not working. <laughs> um, Is it okay if I ask just one one clarifying question uh, to what you talked about, Everett? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, there were two there were two statements that I wrote down, and I, I I tried to capture the quotation exactly. Correct me if I got it incorrect, but I think they were both s statements that were basically trying to say the same thing, um, and I just wanted to understand what they mean a little bit better. So the first statement you said was. There, that there was a systematic effort to erase that I was a Protestant. And then another statement you said, there was an effort to put me into a closet that I never wanted to be in. Um, so could, could you just expand on what that means just a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's my, uh, that's my diplomatic way of saying that uh, Steve DePanger is uh, lying about my background as a Protestant. 
and there are others who are enabling that and it's uh a terrible thing to experience okay i i think that i think that sheds i think i understand what you're trying to say better now okay <clears throat> Um, Catherine, did you have any questions about whatever it, whatever it talked about? I don't think so. I mean, I know there's a lot more detail over it you could have gone into. So if you want to go into detail, obviously, you know, this is a platform for that, but I don't think I have any questions. Okay. Um, so we can... We can, since there's not any more questions, or at least not at the moment, if you do have anything or ever, if you wanted to expand on anything or clarify anything, feel free to jump in at any time. But um, if if we don't have anything more on that on that uh, phase of the conversation, then we can uh, transition back to a continuation of what we were talking about last time. Um, and actually, Jeremy, can I say one thing? Yes, go ahead. I do just I ever I do just want to kind of just say that I I um I don't understand what you're going through because my story is different but I do I think especially because of James which my my son um I think through a lot of how I was raised what things I want to reject what things I don't want to reject realizing in my personal life but also in my career like what what influences things I grew up had and how profound they are um, so I think just like what you were saying about having an identity pushed on you or like being being put back in the closet for something you didn't even want to be in the closet for in the first place, I just want to acknowledge just how profound um, our influences are as children, especially when we're not able to fully comprehend them in the moment until we're adults. Anyways, I just, I just want to acknowledge just how uh, very difficult and profound all those things are. And I, th thank you, Catherine. And I, I would add, I guess maybe I should add to that that you know, over the years, um, I think some people have suggested to me that well, this isn't, this isn't a bit, this isn't a big deal for me because I'm not a Protestant now. But what? What that doesn't factor in is that the, the, the childhood experiences that, as Catherine said, are profound, are they're a part of me right now. There is, and I suspect will always will be, a part of me that is Protestant, and it will and it's there, and it will continue to be there, and it plays a role in my my life uh, because that is the influence of of my childhood uh, development. So uh, it's not we're not, we're not talking about something in the past. We you know I I am currently a former Protestant. And I, I was thinking about recently. I've been thinking about how in English there aren't a lot of words to express that. But what, one word that does come to mind is the word uh, "veteran," which is a term for a for a former soldier. But it exists because even though a veteran is not a soldier. It's important to differentiate between someone who's never been a soldier and someone who is not as a former soldier. And so we have a word for that. And so if we had a word for a former Protestant rather than someone who's never been a Protestant, it, that would that would be a word that would apply to me and would and and that is why all of this has present relevance in my life. I think I think that that terminology makes sense um 
to to an extent i guess there there's limits to that analogy but um uh i found it interesting that you said that there there will always be a part of me that is protestant can you clarify that a little bit uh yeah it's it's hard it, it, it's a difficult thing to articulate but i would say that there, there's a part of my mind that just goes back to what I believed then. And sometimes it'll come just to the – on occasion. It doesn't happen as much anymore, but, but sometimes it'll, it'll come to, uh, to the forefront where just my initial reaction to something will be that. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll adjust quickly, but my initial reaction will be, oh, that's right, or that's wrong. And then due to some, uh, Protestant Christian teaching. Uh, And it also comes out, I, I think over time I have let that part of me I've tried to let that part of me be to be there. I I don't try to suppress it. Uh, so uh, sometimes I'll just listen to uh, music that we listen to as children, just to remind myself of that part of me because it it very much resonates with that part of me. And so I I do that just to. Remind myself of of that part of me, uh, and it also comes out. And for I don't, I don't want to go detour too much into this, but in my uh, writing, in the novel draft that I wrote, if I if I do more, I definitely for some of the characters, I let that part of me uh, come out, so that I can create those particular characters. And that's a very important thing. And it helps with empathy as well. When I'm having particular conversations with uh, particular people, I can let that side out a bit more so that I can be uh, empathetic and understanding to them. So I hope that answers your question. It's a difficult thing to describe. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I, I get that. That um, that does help a lot. Uh if you don't mind me asking just one more question based off of what you you clarified does the when you say that there are times where you'll your kind of your gut response is to evaluate the rightness or wrongness of something based on protestant christian principles or ideas and then you'll you said you'll adapt or whatever um is does does your experience go beyond just evaluating ideas and principles to uh things such as uh maybe a gut reaction i should pray about this or i should uh like if there was a god I would talk to him about this or something on the more like, I guess you could call it the more on the spiritual plane. Um, Are there, is, does that phenomenon exist for you as well? Or is it more, uh, is it more um, limited to what just the things you talked about? Uh, That's a good question. I think sometimes Like, I'll give an example. This is about five years old now, but I was needing to get, I was doing a project and I needed to get some folders for it. Uh, and I needed, like, it was something like, t- I needed 22 folders or, or some, something like that. And I went to the store and I, I, 
I went over to the store to see if they had the type of folders I needed. And on the shelf were exactly that number of folders. And my first reaction was, oh, it's a miracle. And then I stepped back and adjusted. But that, I, that was my first reaction. As far as prayer, I, I, I guess sometimes it could be – I'd have to think about that more. But it, sometimes the, the, the instinctive reaction could be to pray or to expect – you know, to pray slash to expect that if I just think in silence that there's someone there listening to it. Um, so yeah, that it's maybe I'd have to think about that more, but maybe. Okay. Okay, that that makes sense. Um, Catherine, did you have anything you wanted to ask or add at this point? Um, I, well, I guess just going back to ever what you said about uh, the, the idea of a veteran, I was just going to say that I think the word, and not that it captures everything that you were saying, but the word conversion is, captures some of that is it's, it's not just what you are now, but it's that you were something different before. And I know I use that word. I'm always, I always worry if I'm talking to a Protestant that they'll I don't want to offend them by as if I'm saying I change religions drastically or something because there is so much similarity at the same time for me I really there was a big change and so I, I mean it non-offensively but I feel like it captures more of my experience so anyways I just I agree that it's the you, what you were before but it was always going to matter yeah <clears throat> Okay. Um, I wanted to actually throw in one thing before we move on to the uh, the upbringing part of the discussion, which is, Catherine, when you mentioned how some of this, some of our discussion together and, and uh, dad's conversion to Catholicism and, and all that, how that has played into your thinking of uh, how you parent James um I, this has also affected me parentally as well to the extent that I am, am a lot more aware probably than I would have been of my desire to teach him things that I believe to be true, but at the same time to also, uh, to the extent that you can teach a two-year-old to critically think, uh, which is not super relevant yet, but it's not, it's a skill that is, should be probably taught as soon as possible um, to instill the principles early uh, that trying to find that balance is, is, is fairly delicate. And um, it's something I think I'm a lot more attuned to now because of this discussion and just thinking about my own, the, the way that I, I was raised and how I developed my own sense of critical thinking over the years and how I've, gone through the peaks and valleys of my own rational understanding of Christianity and my own faith walk, how, how my, my own pursuit of truth has changed over the years and, and thinking about that in terms of what Zeke may or may not go through. Um, so I, I would say, I guess, uh, I'm grateful for the fact that these are discussions are happening because I do, I actually think the, this is making me a better parent, um, if nothing else. So I am, I am thankful for that. Um, okay. So, uh, I just wanted to put that in there because I didn't ever, you laid out your, your, your heartfelt story and obviously yeah. this is, um, uh, that's like the, the, the cornerstone of, of what we're talking about, but I didn't want it to go unsaid that there, there have been some, although this has been extremely difficult for all of us, this whole process, it, this, there have been some fruit that have come from it. And so I just wanted to express that. Yeah. 
and, and Jeremy, I, I really appreciate what, what you said there about your own parenting, because, you know, it, I think one big lesson out of all of this is that, for me, in my view, is that, you know, the beliefs uh, when you're born, the beliefs of your parents are uh, basically random. If if you'd been born into the family next door or in the family across town or across the world, then you, you'd have parents with different beliefs. And so we that there has there has to be an appreciation of that in life and i think there's a lot of belief systems out there that just don't factor that in at all in, in my view and so i I, and I think it's for me one of the lessons is just to keep that uh is is just to to keep that in mind you you know if you have a kid some other person has another kid well, I mean, they're both, you know, what if the kids were swapped? I mean, not, not to, I mean, I know biologically that doesn't quite work, but uh, then suddenly you have two kids now being raised under opposite influence, or, you know, diff different influences. And so, anyway, it's, I'm sort of rambling, but uh, to me, that's a lesson of all this. So, I pre Jeremy, I appreciate your comments about parenting. Yeah. Um... Yeah, well, you just said that could open up a whole can of worms, but I won't. <laughs> I won't open up that 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 can of worms now. Um, okay, so let's let's uh, let's dive into the upbringing discussion and and kind of discuss that a little bit more. I don't know how much longer we'll need to. I, this is just kind of open ended, and we can bring up topics as needed. Everett, you had mentioned there was a particular song that you wanted to discuss. And I took some time to recollect that song, reread the lyrics. And actually I read a interview of the songwriter about that song uh, to get a little bit of background into why, why he wrote it and what it's about. Um, so you, you had said you wanted to talk about uh, Michael Card's The Greening of Belfast, which when you, I found it a little bit funny because when you brought that up, um, that was like, that was a forgotten song for me because I don't really like that song very much. It what definitely is not in the top eight or nine of his songs that I like. Um, and I, I still listen to him a, a good amount, actually. I think he's one of the best Christian lyricists in, of the last 40 years or more, um, and his, he's written a lot of strong songs, good songs. Um, but yeah, when you mentioned that, I didn't that that song did not uh, ever really resonate with me. But I'm I'm curious why you wanted to talk about that one specifically. Which I guess actually, before you answer that, let me just say for for the folks that will eventually listen to this that Michael Card is a, if you don't know, is a uh, singer-songwriter, uh, Christian singer-songwriter who um, I think came out with his first albums back in like the early mid-80s and uh, was a major part of uh, our music life growing up. Uh, we had CD, Michael Card CDs that were played frequently and um, all three of us have heard most of the songs that he wrote, at least back in the 90s, well, most of the songs that he wrote many, many times. So we're very familiar with him. Um, and there's a particular song that Everett wanted to to discuss. So that's why this isn't just a random, oh, let's talk about a song. There's a, there's actually a little bit of background to that. Sorry, Everett, go, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, so... Can I just read a couple of the stanzas of it? Would that be okay? Uh, go ahead. At this point. Yep. Okay. All right. So, so here, so here's the song. I'm, and I, I'll, let me just focus on the the main part of it. So, the song says, 
in a green, green land, riding on the sea, live a people who speak like a song. But their fertile field lies so fallow and bare, and has borne bitter fruit for so long. Pray for the greening of Belfast, that what is now bearing, barren might bloom and be fair. God loves the city of Belfast, for so many children who love him live there. <clears throat> so many children love him live there. The verdant hills, like strong arms, embrace a heartbreaking, heartbroken town. With the air so full of angels there, it's not hard to imagine the sound. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize I'd get so choked up on this. <clears throat> um, of their cries and fears, of their pleas and prayers, for their city to know peace once more. Let the fighting cease, let the saints be released to join in true spiritual war. Um, so the reason I wanted to talk about that song is because I, Catherine had asked a question about Romania to me last time about whether, how, how aware was I uh, of the Christian factional conflict within Romania? And Actually, afterwards, I went and read a little bit about it, but I, I don't want to dwell too much on that because this is more about our own childhood recollections than it is about the actual world. Uh, but I think that that song is a much clearer example of me being really acutely aware of contemporary Christian violence. Because I... I have never followed Irish and Northern Irish politics very closely. I know some about it now. I knew very little about it when I was little. Um, but I knew, I remember from that song and hearing it many times when it was playing in the home uh, as, as a child, that there was a place called Belfast where uh, there there was Christians killing each other, and I know that that's that's, and I, I'm not trying to actually describe, like I said, Irish politics, and and this is not an attempt to actually argue for whether or not someone should you know vote for Sinn Fein or whatever, but um, it's. It was a time when I was aware as a child that there's 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 an intensive conflict among Christians right now. The song also was important because the lines um, "God loves the city of Belfast for so many children who love Him live there." I understood that to mean uh, that that was. Uh, you know, that was him reaching out to Roman Catholics. And that was him, because I, as far as I understand it, Michael Card is a, a Protestant. I, I I don't know all the details of, of that, but he he was trying to say that, you know, but both both the Northern Irish Protestants and Roman Catholics are on the same team. And I think that might have been, in addition to raising awareness of contemporary Christian conflict, that might have been one of the nicest things that a, a, a non-Roman Catholic said about a Roman Catholic in my presence in my childhood. Uh, that, that he was really emphasizing that, A, there is this division, but, but B, we should uh, back you know, de-escalate it, uh, which is the opposite of the BJU experience, which is th there's this conflict and we should proactively engage in it, um, not violently necessarily, but we should in participate in the conflict and engage in it. And so those are two 
just going off of the childhood distinction between Protestant and Roman Catholic, that's a that's an important one because it's a it's it was a stark reminder of of yeah there is this there is this division and I was aware of that at the time thinking about that song. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. I was just adjusting a couple things on this end. Um, okay. Yeah. I didn't even remember. I, I barely remembered the lyrics, so I did have to reread them. And then in rereading them, I still wasn't totally clear what they were about. So I read an interview that he had um, that was about his album but then it included a pretty lengthy discussion of that song specifically um and i'll just read a, a quote from him just to kind of back up some of the things you were saying or it, it says uh so the art the article says card says he's just not interested in making oh this was back in by the way this is back in february of 1995 was this interview uh, so I was five years old. He said, Card says he's just not interested in making distinctions between Catholic and Christian, although a lot of people, quote, would just shoot me, unquote, for saying so. He noted that a conference he was to speak at recently barred some of the scheduled speakers because they had showed, shown an openness to the Catholic community. Uh, and this is where Card speaks. He says, J.R. Packer was one of them. When I found out they had barred J Packer from this conference, I called and said, you might as well bar me too, because I've always been open to the whole Catholic experience, especially after Vatican II, which was really a reformation of the Catholic Church. I just don't make that sharp a distinction between Catholics and Protestants. I know there's an old orthodoxy within the Catholic Church, purgatory and praying to Mary and all the, those sorts of things, which I biblically wouldn't be able to stand with. But in terms of the things that I would die for, the divinity of Jesus, the nature of the Trinity, the sufficiency of the cross, the second coming, and all those things, there's no problem there. So, yes. And apparently he, his background, he, he his parents are... Um, uh, where does it say? It says that... He has Welsh. I'm not finding it. It's somewhere in here. It talks about his his uh, I think his parents or his lineage or something. Um, so yeah. Anyway, so that's a little bit of background. Yeah, that's really interesting. So that was, you said that was the the nicest thing you had heard. Was there, was that the only thing <laughs> that you heard about that growing up? Well, I mean, may, I, I, maybe not the nicest is, is it's one of the nicest. Is pro, I, I probably shouldn't have been superlative with that. It, it, it's one of the nicest. Um, I, you know, there there was stuff. I was, um, I was trying the between these last two re recordings. I was trying to make a list of people who met the following criteria. One. Uh, we were the, the people that we were exposed to. One was they are they were Roman Catholic. Two, that fact was relevant to why we were exposed to them. Three, they were depicted positively, and four, they didn't come with a uh, sort of warning label that they were Roman Catholic. And I couldn't think of very many. Um, and maybe you guys can think of more, but, and I didn't actually write down the list, but I, I thought of 
um, Benedict, Thomas More, the Von Trapp family singers. And I couldn't think of a whole lot more than that. Von um, Trapps for Catholic? Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought so. Oh, yeah, because she was a, almost a nun. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now the internet thinks I'm tough. <laughs> that's, that's all right. Um, so, I, Jeremy, does that answer your question? Or I... Or... I don't know. Is, is that an answer to your question? Maybe you could rephrase the question. I, sorry. Uh, yes, sorry. I, I had to adjust something yet again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I... Yes, I think so. Okay. I, Benedict. What What Benedict are we talking about? Uh, the Benedict of the Benedictine Order. Oh, okay. Because we read, Catherine and I at least read uh, the the I think it's called the Benedictine Rule, which is the yeah. the governing, the sort of the 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 the, the kind of bylaws or, or the practices of of the Benedictine Order. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and the other one you said was Thomas More, and that was mm -hmm. didn't we have a, a a black and white movie about him, or am I thinking of something else? I mean, it's not all seasons. Yeah. It's like yeah. in the ones that win Academy Award. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and, and which today, that's been a long time since I've seen it, but in my mind, I, I continue to think of it as one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a very good film. It's also about Christian on Christian violence, but in that case, it's the, uh, the Roman Catholic who's murdered. Okay. Um, yeah, I remember. I remember that movie. I remember the phenomenon of that movie more than I remember that the stuff in the movie. Um, but I remember that. I remember the the execution scene at the end. Um, yeah. And just wishing and wishing that they would change their mind at the last minute, like I think any six year old or whatever would do watching that movie. Uh, <clears throat> I think I was at the age where my I, I just had a more naive assumption of people's benevolence. And so mm -hmm. I just assumed that. Oh, he's maybe he's not actually going to die, or they'll change their mind, or they're not that mad at him. Yeah, that's that's a fair reaction. <clears throat> um. Okay. Yeah. It, as to whether there's other people on that list of, I think it was four parameters you laid out. I don't think I can think of any anybody. Uh. I've probably encountered more people like that since childhood. I'm sure I have, but not yeah, not not as a kid, I don't think I can think of anything anybody else. Um I mean, just we read the 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 Saint Benedict thing, but then we also there were other Catholic writers that we would have read so i remember what you're talking about everett so there would have been dante Al algieri however you say his name it was some other yeah. right and things also that predated the protestant reformation but i don't i understand the like the story of a person right we don't know anything about him yeah i i think i thought a little bit about dante dante's a tough one because Dante, if I'm recall, well, there are popes in hell. I mean, he's he's not. Um, you know, I, he's a 
I, he, he's a close on that. Uh, well, uh, I'm now forgetting my criteria, but I, th I think the, the, the second criterion of that it, it's his Roman Catholicism that's why he was exposed to us. I think he's a close call on that one to me. I was also only in eighth grade when I read it, so it's been a very long time. And as to why we read it, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. But but yeah you're I mean, are you talking about the Divine Comedy specifically? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I guess it's just considered part of classical literature or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who made that decision, but... It, it is a very heavily Catholic book, though. It... I mean, it has it, purgatory and other No, that's, that's right, true. Right. That, that part's definitely... Yeah, <laughs> but but no, even that, the theology of it, I think, is, as much as I recall, is a more heavily Catholic book. I don't know if, how much I understood of that as an eighth grader, but, yeah. It is. Yeah, I, I think, yes, you could you could make an argument that Dante deserves to be on the list. Sure. <clears throat> so um were there other were there other components of our I think we've got if we want to round out an hour we've got about 8 minutes left. So were there other aspects of our upbringing of our religious upbringing that came to your mind ever that you wanted to bring up or discuss or Catherine? Um, well, there, there is the rest of that list that from originally, I mean, oh, I yeah. don't know if we, if we want to keep going through that list, but I don't, uh, do you happen to remember? I can, I can research real quick and pull it up, but do you happen to remember which ones we hadn't talked about yet? I think Billy Graham, Pathway Readers, Azusa Pacific University. Um, those were three of them. I think there might be another. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, we can we can go through that, I guess. Uh, yeah. I don't. We'll probably not, we probably won't have time to go through all of them, but. Um, I mean, and, and if you don't want to get into a, a new topic like that in the last few minutes, I mean, we can stick with, you know, if, if like, if, if, like, I mean, Catherine, you know, to spend some time in Ireland. So if she wants to talk about some of that, we could do that too. You know, whatever people want to do. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, to me, it's not really a new topic because it's just a continuation of what we were already talking about. It's sort of a subtopic. So if we want to, mm -hmm. if we want to try to tackle one of those, that's fine. I personally, I don't have a whole lot of memory. I do remember going to one of the Billy Graham concerts. I don't remember. I, I mean, Azusa Pacific University is where we had, we had some speech and debate tournaments there. Uh, but I don't remember why that would have been significant to me besides that. And the pathway readers obviously was how I learned how to read out loud which I hated. I absolutely hated reading out loud. It was one of the things that I uh, put up an absolute fit at mom about. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad I was forced to do that because I am now capable of doing that fairly well. And I don't think I would be if I, if I hadn't been taught that. So, um, but that could have been done really through any vehicle. That was just the vehicle that mom chose to use to, to have us practice reading out loud so or at least me so um is is that is that your guys's re recollection too that the main purpose of those books was to learn how to read out loud uh, yeah both re learning to read and learning to read out loud i guess i have zero recollection i like have a vague memory but i have uh don't remember that. okay there are a series of books that each have their own color and they're hardback and they get slightly bigger as you go through the series and a little bit more I, complicated. I remember that, but like I don't remember the content. 
Oh yeah, I, I don't either. So the, the Jeremy, do you want me to say why I brought that one up? Y- yeah, I, I would, because I'm I'm at a loss. So, uh, the the pathway readers had a section toward it was in the older grade levels of books that was just an intense as i remember it and again this is just my memory uh, a a pretty intense uh series of accountings of affirmation martyrdoms on typically i i think it was focused on anabaptists particularly I, I may not be remembering that right. I it, it, one in particular uh, comes to mind that there was a guy who he he lives in some place and he's a he's some Christian faction and he tra- and he gets on a boat and he travels to the port of another place in Europe. And at the port, the local officials arrest the whole ship because the local officials have determined that uh, they're pirates. And so this guy is under arrest, and he says to the local officials, look, I am I was just a passenger. And he walks through his affiliations and his background and says, I was just a passenger. Can you let me go? And the local officials say, oh, well, the, the pirating is bad, and we'll punish those people, but given your affiliations, we're going to execute you. And so I, there was just, that's one, I just, I remember there just being several of those. And so that's just another example of the, expo- of that exposure to the distinction and the violence in between um, from that was just the the framework of childhood for me. Okay. Those are really intense. I have a problem with that. I mean, it depends how old the age it was like directed at. It could be ever that your reading ability was years advanced. You know what I mean? I- you were like four, and it should have been for like an eight-year-old. Yeah, no, I, th- I think I was probably about ten, probably, at, at that point. I was, my my guess mm-hmm. is I was somewhere in the neighborhood of ten. Even I think that's old enough to have a conversation, but that needs to be a conversation about. Yeah, um, that's not something that a ten-year-old would be able to uh, absorb very well, I don't think, or be able to process very effectively. Without help, I can agree to that. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think I ever. I actually don't think ever. Now that you mention it, that there were those last couple of books that were for the higher grades. I don't think I ever made it to the last book. Yeah, and I may have not gotten all the way through either, but it, it's quite possible that I got that that I got further than both of you. That that's that's very possible. So you're saying if we did a reading aloud contest now that you would win because you went through all of the pathway readers? Probably not. But <laughs> probably not. <clears throat> we can all submit. We can all submit uh, an audio book of a book of our choosing to uh, whatever the major audio book publishers are, and then see who gets signed. Okay, so we're we're coming up on an hour. Um, I think this is probably a good stopping point for this discussion. Um, I think we'll we'll make a decision offline about uh, if and when and how we want to proceed with this with these recordings. Um, if we want to continue this part of the discussion or move on to a different topic or maybe just stop. We'll, we'll make that determination offline, but I think this this recording was a good round off of our uh, 
discussion about our religious upbringing and also a chance for Everett to share his to share his story uh, and make that make that public, uh, really officially public for the first time. And um, uh, we appreciate Everett. I think I can speak for Catherine when I say we appreciate that you were willing to do that with us and that you had the bravery to to discuss that from your own heart. So we thank you for that. And oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So, uh, any, any closing thoughts before we, before we wrap up with this episode? No. None from, none from Everett, none from you, Catherine. No. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you guys for participating in the discussion. Thank you, uh, to those of you that uh, will eventually listen to this recording. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, and we will see you next time. Take care.